on August 29th, 1984, a young lady named Shannon was getting ready for school. It was the third day of her junior year of high school, and she was running a little late, and so she was applying her lipstick as she drove her Plymouth Champ to school on a windy country road. When she was doing that, she took her eyes off the road for a moment to adjust her rearview mirror when she felt, she felt a jolt in the car. She realized that she had hit something. She stopped, got out of the car, hoping to find a dead animal on the road, but instead she saw the lifeless body of a lady named Marjorie Jarstford lying a few feet from her bicycle. And soon the thought occurred to this young lady, Shannon, that she had hit, she had hit somebody's mom and daughter and wife. Marjorie Jarst, for a former missionary with Wycliffe Bible translators, likely died on impact. In the blink of an eye, Shannon's life changed. By her own admission, she was living a, a party girl life promiscuously, and now here she was facing criminal charges for the death of this dearly loved Christian woman. She had contemplated suicide in the days that followed, and she may have, save for the grace of God and the graceful response of Marjorie's husband, Gary Jarstfer. Upon hearing the circumstances of his wife's death, Gary's early thought and early response was how Shannon must be feeling and whether or not whether or not she was okay. The response astounded Shannon. God eventually, or Gary forgave the 16-year-old girl and asked the attorney to drop all the charges against her, saving her from a probable guilty verdict. He told Shannon that his wife had felt that God would call her home soon and that Shannon was the instrument he used because she was tough. In the first meeting between, between Shannon and Marjorie's family the day before the funeral, Gary simply told Shannon to continue in the godly footsteps that his wife had taken. You can't let this ruin your life, he told her. God wants to strengthen you through this. In fact, he said, I am passing Marjorie's legacy of being a godly woman onto you. There's more, more of the story I'm going to share later, but Shannon came to embrace the challenge and the call given to her by God through that accident. And Gary's act of forgiveness showed Shannon the amazing grace and, and love of God. Today, Shannon's last name is Etheridge, and she's lived the legacy passed on to her. She's a best-selling author of many, many books, Every Girl's Battle, Every Woman's Battle, Every Woman's Marriage. One of her books, Completely His, Loving Jesus Without Limits, helps women overcome guilt-ridden, wounded lives. She's touched countless of numbers of women and young ladies with her message of sexual purity and the grace of God to, to overcome everything and, and even guilt. Well, Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through, 20, or through 35, go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. I'm going to have all the scriptures on the screen, but I'd rather for you to look at your own Bibles. But in this, in this part of the Bible, Jesus tells his own story about, about grace, about amazing grace and reckless love. But the story is not about a grace that's given as the story we just heard, but rather it's about a grace that is withheld. A grace that is withheld, forgiveness that is not granted. Now, I understand the concept. I get it. The concept of giving grace is a lovely concept, unless you're talking about maybe, maybe the father who berated you or the relative who abused you. I mean, it's fine to, to give grace unless it's a spouse who cheated on you or maybe it's a boss who treated you unjustly or, or the person who hurt you or hurt those whom you love. And, and then grace tends to get a little bit messy. And every single person undoubtedly in this room could tell your own story of being treated unfairly. Proverbs chapter 14, 10 says that every heart, every heart knows its own bitterness Every, everybody has a story. Every heart has its own bitterness that we have at times, every one of us, felt embarrassed, felt ignored, felt overlooked. Maybe we felt abused or treated unfairly. There are things that people have done against us, every one of us. Every one of us has our own reason for bitterness. Well, in this passage, Jesus tells a parable known as the unjust servant or the, or the unmerciful servant. And in this parable, this story, he helps us understand the grace that, that, that the effect that grace has in our lives. 
And because we've been given grace by God, then we should also be very free and lavish in giving grace to the people around us. Because we have received, we should give. Now, Peter's the one that asked the question that started this. And, and, and if you know Peter's story at all, you got to wonder what, like what prompted him to ask this question. But here he is in Matthew 18. In Matthew 18, 21, Jesus, he says to Jesus, hey, 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 Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how, how many times, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? So he throws, this, he throws this number out past Jesus. And from Peter's perspective, this probably was pretty gracious. So in his background as a Jewish person, the, the rabbis of Jesus' day taught that you ought, to get, you ought to forgive somebody three times. But after that, you're off the hook. Like if, if they do something against you the fourth time, like then God's, God's going to deal with them. So it had, kind of had this three strikes rule. So Peter says seven times because... Because I think that was probably the number that somebody, somebody behind the question had wronged him or had hurt Peter. Not just once, not just twice, not just three times, but maybe many times. And so Peter wonders, Peter wonders, how, how, how far does this forgiveness thing go? I'm guessing, I'm guessing Peter's not the only one that wonders that. When, you know, when is, when is enough enough? I mean, when am I off the hook? When does grace run out? When does grace stop giving? Maybe, maybe you've got somebody in your life whom you would like to, to have that question answered about. It's a natural question because here's the thing. Giving grace, forgiving people goes against, like goes against our nature. It goes against our, like our sinful humanity, doesn't it? When, when we give grace to somebody, we give them something that they don't deserve. Right? And, the, and there's something in us that, like, we, do, we recoil at that. People ought to get what they deserve. Like, we shouldn't give them something that they don't deserve. The word most often used for grace, as we're talking about it in this little series, and this is the second week, but, but this little word for grace is, is the word charis, charis in Greek. It's, it's a word that means undeserved, unmerited gift. When somebody talks about a gift, this is the word that's used, the literal gift. Here's a gift. It's this word that's used because it's, it's a gift. It's something we don't, we don't deserve. And some of that goes against our nature, doesn't it? It just does. I, I, I don't know about you, but like I, I, really like, I really like Carrie Underwood's music. You know, it's an amazing story. She won American Idol several years ago. And now she's this country superstar. And you know that several years ago, one of her first hits was, was The Next Time He Cheats, right? You know, the, you know the song. It, it became a number one hit. People loved it. People loved it. And in the song, she just imagines getting even with an ex-boyfriend by destroying his souped-up truck or SUV. She's going to scratch the paint with her keys. She's going to carve out her name on the leather seat. She's going to take a Louisville slugger and beat out his headlights. And then the chorus says, maybe next time. Maybe now. I'm not going to sing it. You don't want that. <laughs> maybe next time he'll think before he cheats. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a reason why that song climbed to number one, right? Because we might sing Jesus take the wheel, but when somebody hurts us, we want that wheel back. We want to get revenge. We want to, we want to even the score. And so Peter, Peter wants to know. I want to know. Maybe some of you want to know. Maybe some of you understand this. When? Jesus, ser seriously, Jesus. When? Like, when is enough enough? So Jesus answered him in verse 22. Well, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times, or seven times seven, however you want to interpret that. It's a lot more than Peter was anticipating. And Jesus makes it clear that the, the, this grace is something that never, like it never stops giving. And to me, the real challenge with grace, giving grace, is, is just because it's so daily. It's so daily. Think of it kind of this way. All of us, imagine all of us, we have this account called grace. We all have this like this grace account. And people are constantly making withdrawals from your grace account, right? Like, we've only got so much, and if, and if I ex give too much or people take too much from me, then I'm going to run out. And some of these, like I get it, some of these withdrawals, they've been pretty significant. Maybe some time ago, your grace account took a pretty hard hit by somebody who did something unspeakable to you. And maybe, you, maybe you've been in the red in that account for a long time. And you're continuing to give grace now for something that somebody did back, way back then. 
I could tell you stories of people I know. But again, we all have our own stories. People who depleted our grace accounts. And maybe a big withdrawal. Maybe it wasn't something that big and significant. Maybe it was just a a smaller daily sort of everyday withdrawal of life that that I think tend to deplete our account more because, because it's just all the time. Something big happens to us. We, 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 we deal with it, hopefully. We get over it. We hopefully move past it. But it's those little, little daily withdrawals that stretch our grace account thin. So Jesus goes on here to tell this story, a parable of, of how we ought to be better grace givers. And here's what he says in verse 23. So Jesus said, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Verse 24, he says, as, as he began the settlement, a, a, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold or, or 10,000 talents, talents a measure of money, which when Jesus said this must have been just, the crowd must have gasped when he said this. This was a ridiculously large, huge amount of money. The, the, nobody listening to him, very, very few people, if any, even had that. This, this 10,000 bags of gold. People would have been aghast at this. So this man who owed him 10,000 talents, 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And, and, and so this is the, the equivalent of a, of a minimum, minimum wage work in our country owing like tens of millions of dollars. And Jesus is making the point here, obviously, that the amount isn't, like he's just making the point that it's, there's no way that he could possibly ever, like ever pay this back. He, he could never ever in this lifetime and a million more could never pay this amount back. So verse 25 says, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Yeah. Like that's, that's, that's how they, that's how seriously they took this stuff back then in the ancient world. In fact, in Athens, before there was the establishment of private rights for citizens, this would be the practice. You would put a person who owed you an amount of money into prison, or you'd sell them into slavery, but not just them. Like their whole family as well. And that's what's happening here. The man says, I'm, I'm going to sell you and your family into slavery. Like we're, you're going to have a garage sale, and we're going to take everything that you have, every last thing, and we're going to, and we're going to sell it. Now, clearly, Jesus is telling a story that reflects our standing with God, that we, are, that we are called into account, that we owe a tremendous debt that can never, ever be repaid. The only way that it can be made right with the king is to pay this debt back, but there is, in fact, there's no way that he is going to be able to do that. There's no way that it can ever be repaid. And so there's this kind of, this terrifying moment. Maybe some of you in, in, in the matter, actual matter of finances in life, maybe you've had this, this terrifying moment where, where you realize that what you owe is more, like is more than you'll ever be, ever be able to pay back. And you're called into account. It's all, it's all right there. It's all black and white. The Bible talks about this day where, where we will all have to give an account for the life we've lived. Things that we've said. Things that we have thought. And we discover on that day that God, that God knows it all. God knows everything. We, we may, we may have fooled somebody, but God, God knows it all. After, after killing Marjorie Jars for Shannon Etheridge didn't immediately become the woman of God that she is now. She drifted in and out through college of being a Christian and not being a Christian. She actually planned to be a mortician. But she tells in one of her books about how the, how the grace of God finally broke through to her because as a mortician, she thought that she would be embalming mostly elderly, older people, right? She was shocked how many, how many people she was embalming in their 20s and 30s of, who have died of, of age or drunk driving or suicide. And, and it caused her to reflect on her admittedly morally loose teen years. And she thought, you know what? There but for the grace of God go I. This was the moment she, she recounts that she finally took hold of the legacy of Marjorie Jarstfer and started on her own journey to what she is today. She realized, she realized that there will be this terrifying moment where, where we stand before the king and the bill comes due and the bill is more than we could ever, ever pay. And then what do we do? Shannon, she could never repay her debt to Gary in a million years. How do you... How do you live with that kind of guilt and that kind of condemnation? 
I mean, yes, an amount of money can theoretically be paid. It's possible, maybe. But taking a life, nothing can repay that debt. There, there's nothing that, that enters into the, that equation that would erase that. The only, the only way is through grace, a gift, unmerited grace, extended and received. And it's the same with us. The Bible says that we are all sinful people. How can we, how can we repay the debt? How can we live with the guilt? We can't. That's why we need the grace of God. And that without the unmerited gift, the, the unmerited kindness and grace of God, we would be nowhere. So our, our, like our response probably wouldn't be unlike the servants in verse 26. It, it says that he, he fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. And I'll pay everything back, it says. And the master's, the servant's master, it says, took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. So this is an amazing, an amazing act of grace where the CEO wipes out this huge amount of debt. But I want you to notice the almost comical response before this man receives grace. Look what he says to the master. He says, please be patient with me. And then what does he say? I will pay back everything. Like he's, like he's probably just trying to buy this time and I get that. But like how ridiculous is that? There's no way that he could ever pay back that amount of money. They didn't even have Powerball Lottery back then. Like, there's, like even if he got lucky and struck it rich, like he, there's no way. He's making a promise out of desperation that he never could possibly keep in a million years. And yet that's the way I think that many of us, that's the way that many of us like have approached God at, many, at various times. We, well, we come to God with these promises of God. God, I'm, I'm going I'm to make it right. I know I'm, I'm going to make up for where I failed. And we, we, we adopt sort of this, this debtor's mentality where every morning we wake up determined to somehow even up the account or get the ledger more on our side. And so we think that if we can do enough good things, maybe it'll outweigh some of the bad things we do. And, and we just have this mentality that, that, that God is angry, that we owe him this, I owe him this amount, I'll never be able to pay it. So Many times people live their entire lives trying to pay off this debt that they can never repay by acts of righteousness and doing good deeds. And, and those are all fine, but that's not even covering the interest. I mean, you're throwing pennies at a, like at a multi-million dollar debt. You keep living like that and eventually you get more and more and more frustrated and eventually what you do is you just you quit trying altogether. Titus, I love Titus chapter 3 verse 5 explains it this way. It says, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his own, his own mercy. God's own decision, like to not give us what we deserve, praise God. His mercy. So I want you to notice what it says of the king in verse 27. It says, he took pity on him. He took pity on him. This, is, this, is, this again would have really piqued the interest of the people listening to Jesus. Why in the world would this man, would this king, why would, he have, why would he have pity on him? This word pity also translated in the word compassion. Pity, compassion, this great, word, this great Greek word splunkna. And it's often used to describe when Jesus looked out on people and it says that Jesus had compassion because they were his people without a shepherd. It's that same word, pity, compassion. So in this passage, the king ex extends grace to the servant and we come before God owing a huge debt and the debt is wiped out because of Jesus Christ. Now I wish, like I wish, I would, I would love for this to be where the story ends. I mean, I wish we could all just leave this place celebrating God's grace and go home and just bask in it, but that's not where the story ends. In fact, it takes a disturbing twist in part two of the story. Verse 28, it says, but when that servant went out, so when this servant who had been forgiven this huge debt went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. This would have been just a few hundred bucks. And he grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Verse 29 says, his fellow, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me. I'll pay you back. So we're hearing the same words, the same language that was used when this servant appealed to his master. And now his coworker is asking for the same grace that he himself received on a much, much smaller scale. Now, if you're listening, 
If you're listening to Jesus tell the story, there's this little doubt of what's going to happen, right? Like we know what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. Of course, of course this man is going to forgive. This man who's been been discharged from a $10 million debt is going to forgive this other guy that owes him a few hundred bucks. Surely that's what's going to happen. But that's not what happens. Verse 31 says, When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and they told their master everything that had happened. Verse 32 says, When the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Verse 34 says, In anger, the master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed, which we know will never, ever, ever happen. And then Jesus concludes the story with one simple, terrifying sentence. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. And so, like we could... We could get into all kinds of theological nuances and look at other scriptures and all that where we're not saved by by works, we're saved by grace. But let's just, let's just, for a moment, let's just reflect in what Jesus, his whole point for this parable is what he says just there. And he's just really clear. He's really clear for people who have, who have received his grace and then to not give grace to others is, is, is not an option. Not, it's not an option It's not an option to to come here to church every week and to celebrate his grace and to take communion and to sing songs about about this grace when we're holding a grudge or holding something over somebody's head or, or, or refusing to forgive somebody. Maybe it's a grudge toward a coworker. Maybe it's resentment toward a parent. Or maybe it's bitterness toward a sibling. I don't know what it is. We can't just hold on to that and then with the same hand receive the grace that God gives us. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not, like I'm not naive. I'm really not. I've, I know the stories. I know a lot of your stories. I know my own stories. I, I know that some of you have been hurt in ways that, that I can't ever, ever imagine and hope, frankly, that I don't have to one day. But Jesus is making the very clear point here that we will never be asked to give more grace to somebody else than we've already been given by God through Jesus. And so the best option is to be one who freely extends grace, who who lavishly grants forgiveness. That we would get rid of the the bitterness and the anger in our hearts. And so how do we do that? How do we we do that? Well, I think there's a a couple things in the story. First, again, we remember the grace that's been given to us. This is the, the, the main point of the parable, that we have been forgiven this ridiculous debt that we could never replay, repay. And so we need, to, we need to let that make us be more gracious toward others. We need to be more gracious toward others. There's a, there's a, a great little verse in 1 Corinthians 13 that says, love keeps no record of wrongs. It just means you don't hold on to things, you know. Sometimes I do that, though. Sometimes I can hold on to a grudge like a, like a, like a mother cat holds a kitten in her, in, her, in her clutch, you know? Like, I can, just, I can just hold on to that. Lori and I, she's not here, so I'll tell a Lori story. This is the part of the sermon where Chris tells you yet another stupid thing that he's done in his... So Lori and I, we've been married a couple years, so we had it all down. We were good a couple years. We were pros, Right? And I did something that this, to this day surely must rank as one of the stupidest things a man ever did. So we had a, we had a three-year-old car. I bought it brand new. It was only three years old. One day I went, took that white car out to get an oil change. I told Lori I'm going out to get the oil change in the car. But while I was, while I was driving around, I, I drove through a car dealership and got to looking. And, 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 and one car in particular caught my eye. It was a green car. Now, we had, we had looked at this particular model before, and we said that if we ever got a bigger car, we'd get green because we liked that color, and it was the 90s, and everybody was buying green, everything, right? But it really never got much further in our discussions <laughs> until that day. I talked myself out of it, took my car back to the service place to take it in for the oil change, and while they're changing the oil, I go out, and I continue to walk around this, this car dealership, and yeah, I bought a, I bought a new car, 
Still had to pay for the oil change. I couldn't even have done it before I had the oil change in the other one, right? I bought a new car without telling my wife. And I'm driving this car home and I'm thinking, what, what, what have you done? I was hoping that she would like immediately get struck with some form of color blindness where she would look at the green car and think that it's white. Like, I don't think that's how color blindness works. But she, she noticed. <laughs> Can you hear her saying these words? What did you do? What, what, what did you, what did you do? She got over it. She didn't hold it against me because she never does. Not long after that, maybe a couple days, I was going to pick her up from work because we, <laughs> we only had the one car. And, and, and she was late coming out of where she worked at the seminary where I went to. She was a faculty secretary and whatever. And she was, she, she just is always, she was late. She's always late coming out. And I'm not a person that's very patient. I, it's, a, it's a sin. I, it really is. I, I, I don't like to wait. I have this trigger in me. It's kind of like a fuse that like I can wait a certain amount of time and feel pretty good about myself because I'm patient. But man, when it gets one tick past that, the, the fuse kicks off and, and I get angry. And I was, I was pretty irritated. She, she came, she, uh, the, the door where she came out of was up some steps. And so she came out the door about 35 minutes late, so to speak. And she's walking down the steps and I'm getting my speech prepared. Like if you, I'm getting my speech prepared. And then, and then I looked, I was, I was admiring the, because I just waxed it, the gleam of our, of our car. And I was looking at the hood of our green car and I saw her, God, God's so funny. I saw her reflection coming down in the hood of my car. I got filled with grace really, really quickly at that moment, right? How, how, like, how could I get mad at her when I do such ridiculously stupid things? Say, so, well, that's, that's a, that's a really good sermon illustration, Chris. That hits the point. It's all nice and tidy. Yes, it makes you look kind of silly, but we laugh about it and all oh, with that preacher silly. Listen, there's a lot of things that I could use to make the same point that I don't want to because, quite frankly, they're embarrassing. And if you heard some of them, you might not even want to, you might not even want me up here preaching. But there's something about being on the end of amazing grace that should cause us to be gracious. Colossians 3 says, forgive as you have been forgiven. So when we reflect upon God's grace, it ought to cause us to be gracious. That should be the effect that it just sort of, the more we become mature Christians, it ought to more automatically come in our lives. I think secondly, we've got to refuse to let little things bother us. Now the second the seventh, second servant basically owed this guy some lunch money. Like it wasn't a whole lot of money. And yet he had him thrown in prison. And giving grace in the small areas, in my opinion, I think can oftentimes be more difficult. In fact, just to be honest with you, this is really where I struggle. Like it's just sort of the, like, like being late or the everyday small annoyances that, that yes, somebody might have slighted you or somebody said something against you or somebody posted something on Facebook, but they're, but they're small things, but they can, listen, they can grow and accumulate and they can be a problem. And I need to be so much more gracious when things happen. Now, I know for, I know for some of you, there are bigger areas. I, quite frankly, I, I've never had anything really happen into my life that was so horrible that I really, really struggled with, you know, like I, that's not been my life so far. I'm sure there probably will be at some point, but some of you, some of you know that. Some of you, there are a lot bigger areas in your life. So I just want you to notice a couple other things. In, in verse 27, teaches us how to, like, how to release resentment, how to not keep a record of wrongs. And, and so in verse 27, it says, the master's servant took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Now, those two verbs successively here could be used, to, could be translated both as to forgive, but they carry different ideas. The first one, canceled the debt, has this idea of releasing resentment. It's an accounting term, like there's no debt owed anymore. The idea that you no longer allow the past to affect the future. You don't bring it up. You release it. You cancel it. The past is gone. You don't hold it over that person's head. You don't choose an opportune time to remind them of what they did or said. Canceled. The other one says he let him go. He let him go. This is the, the idea that he, did the, he didn't retali re retaliate. He didn't try to, to even the score. It says that he let him go. 
And you know as well as I do that there comes a point where, where we have to say, at risk of our spiritual lives and our mental health, we have to say, like, I'm just, I'm going to let God be God and I'm going to give that to God. I'm going to let God deal with that. Whatever that person did, whatever that person said, I'm going to, I'm going to let him go. I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to try to get even. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to automatically grant the person the same status in your relationship. Maybe you should not be around the person anymore. Maybe it was an abusive relationship. And even though you forgive, doesn't mean that you've got to restore that person to the same relationship. Understand me. But it just means that you're like, you're going to just going to let it go. You're going to let it go. I think one of the most, to me anyway, I, I think one of the most amazing parts of the story of Shannon Etheridge and Gary and Marjorie Jarstfer is when Shannon, she met the family for the first time, imagine this, met the family for the first time in the funeral home before the funeral. And she said, I didn't, I didn't want to meet the family. She was petrified. Here she was, 16-year-old girl. She'd been living a promiscuous life, about to meet the godly family of the lady that she had killed. But as she tells the story, she went to the jars for, uh, she went into the funeral home. And, and she met Gary, who came at her first, not with hate and venom, but with arms open wide. Shannon, Shannon recounts, he just, he just hugged me as I sobbed. He just hugged me. He hugged me as I sobbed, and I'm, and I'm repeating over and over, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And pretty soon she said his, his own tears were mingled with mine as I heard him say, you're forgiven. Gary Jarst for arms open wide, granting grace and forgiveness just as God had done for him and just as God does for us. Now, I'll be honest with you, I... I read so many stories like that. I, I hear so many stories like that of, of amazing grace being given. And I think, like I think, I don't know. I don't know. If I'm honest, I, I don't know how I would have responded if I were Gary Jarsfer. I don't know. Like, I, I would like to think I would do the same thing, but I, like, I just don't know. I'd like to think eventually, but I, I think there are things like that. The big things, these stories we hear, and you think to yourself, well, how would I react in that situation? And you don't, you don't know. And, and oftentimes I hear people say to other people that have gone through some trauma, like, I don't know, I don't know how you're, I don't know how you're coping, or I don't know how you're getting through this, or whatever. And, and, and that's true, because they don't know. And sometimes God, sometimes God gives us the grace that we need for whatever moment that we're in. So I cling to that. I hope, I hope that I would open my arms wide to extend forgiveness if, if something like that were to happen to me. And certainly the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can help you do amazing things. But sometimes I wonder, I wonder. I, I, have, I have a hard time granting forgiveness to people to do smaller things to me. It's interesting, I told you about this book last week, Philip Yancey, my, one of my favorite writers, everybody should read his books, wrote a book, What's So Amazing About Grace. And he writes that at first, the, the book of the title that he had in mind when he wrote the book was, What's So Amazing About Grace and Why Don't Christians Show More of It? Like he, that's what he wanted his book to be titled. And the publisher or the editor, you know, the, the suits, in the corner offices, who usually have the last say in these things, made him drop the last part in which we're challenged to examine our lives. Now, maybe, maybe they thought, well, you know, we know how these things work, and it's just too long of a title. But I think what they thought was it would kind of turn some people off from buying the book or reading the book. I think they should have left that last part on. And so does Philip Yancey. That's why he wrote many books after that, expounding on that very theme. But, but why don't Christians show more of it? And so, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe as we sit here and as, as you listen to this, we've, we've read this parable and we've listened to what Jesus says, maybe we need to ask the question, is there something that I, somebody I need to talk to? Is there a note that I need to write? Is there a, is there a, a call that I need to make? Is there somebody that I need to extend grace to? Or maybe, maybe I need to ask for it. Maybe I need to ask for forgiveness. And maybe you need to walk across the street or walk across the aisle or walk across the next cubicle or walk across the kitchen or look across the table and extend grace. 
Listen, Jesus' intent with this story could not be more clear. It couldn't be more clear. That because here's the thing, our Heavenly Father's arms are open wide, waiting to receive us, waiting to forgive us, waiting to grant us newness of life and freedom from guilt if we would accept it, freedom from self-reproach. And he's made it clear that he loves you more than, he, than we can possibly imagine. He's offered you grace. He's offered me grace. And, and it's not because we deserve it. It's not because we could ever earn it. It's just because he wants to. He loves us. And all we have to do is open our arms and accept it. And he wants to wipe out this debt of sin that we owe against him completely if we will just accept Christ into our lives. If we'll just be washed clean in the waters of, of baptism. That we can have a relationship with Christ and empowered through the, through the Holy Spirit. We can do these things. We can give people grace. We can, we can be even more grace-filled than maybe even Gary Jarsfer was. But it's, it's not an option as Christians to be forgiven everything that we've been forgiven of. I would encourage you to kind of bring to mind some of your own sins or problems or things you've done against people, things you've said against people. Just kind of let them roll around in your mind for a moment. Not to feel guilty about them if you're a Christian, but just sometimes we forget. If we've been a Christian for any number of years, like we forget how horrible we were. <laughs> sometimes we forget how horrible we are. But, but we need to just, we need to remember the amazing love and grace of God. And if you're here this morning, if you're watching uh, during the week or whenever, and if you, you've not, listen, the only way that we're going to be with God one day is to have our sins forgiven. The only way to do that is through Christ. There's no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved than Jesus Christ. And church, if we, ever, uh, if we ever lose sight of that, if we ever lose sight of the fact that it's forgiveness through Jesus Christ because of the power of his resurrection, that Jesus Christ was bodily resurrected, I hear Christians today all over the place saying, do we really need to believe in a literal resurrection? Like, yeah, that's kind of the whole point. Like, why, why are we even here if you don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, says Paul, our faith is futile. And it's the same Jesus who was resurrected from the dead who told this story. Who told us about a God who loves us so much that even though we continually, we continually still do it, sin, if we're in him, he loves us. And if you've not said, Jesus, I want to, I want to, I want to, I need my sins forgiven. If you've not done that, I'd love to talk to you about that. Don't, don't put it off. Like, don't put it off. We don't know, none of us, what this day, what this week, what this year holds. That ought to be abundantly clear to all of us by now. There's going to come a day. Don't put it off. 